Felicity. Roshanara, please. Hello, and congratulations again on the reappointment. I, I've just got a couple of supplementaries on on Wylands and Greensill. Given what you just said about non-banks uh, and some of the potential risks, um, can you just talk us through what you would what you'd like to see happen? What you'd like to do to try and mitigate future risks? Because if you, you mentioned the ten billion, um, if that happened at, at, on a number of fronts, that's pretty serious, isn't it? What do you think should should be done about non-banks? What were the kind of three things or two things that you mm. would want to see happen? Well, I completely agree. That is the worry. Uh, it's a worry that a single one can deliver a hit of that size. And obviously, if that happened several times over, you might have a much more serious uh, problem. So this is a very live discussion uh, at the moment internationally uh, amongst regulators, both the um, prudential regulators of banks, uh, but also those who oversee um, uh, the markets. And uh, I'm hoping that we will be able to come at this from, from two ends. W one is, from the banking end, I do think we need to overhaul the way these types of exposures are managed within the banking sector. And there's basically two angles to that. One is, how are they risk managed? So we've got an investigation underway currently, jointly with uh, other supervisory colleagues from other jurisdictions into the Archegos affair. But it already seems obvious to me that one of the main learnings will be that some firms do not have sufficiently dynamic margining. So basically, the collateral they've got doesn't keep up with the positions. And then if it all goes wrong very suddenly, they're caught short. It seems like an amazingly obvious thing. Um, but that, I'm afraid, is, I think, one of the things that's happened here. So that is an important thing that needs, I think, to be sorted out. And, does, and can I just check one sure. more thing, which is, does the senior, presumably the senior management regime doesn't apply to non-banks in the same way, should it? Do, have I got this right? And the same with uh, Greensill. One of the issues that came up is that Greensill uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't that, that regime, it doesn't apply to them either. Well, it depends which. So the it does not apply to Greensill. Uh, you are right. Um, uh, and by the way, interesting side point here. Um, uh, Mr. Gupta is fit and proper as a controller, but he's not within, he's not an approved person within the senior manager's regime. So that's another interesting distinction here. Um, Greensill were outside the senior manager's regime. Had they had a bank in the UK, we of course would have had them inside our senior manager's regime. Um, and interesting question, you know, uh, well, had they... Well, the question is, they did have a bank elsewhere in Germany, right? So yeah, should it, should it well, not be, given they have a banking function over there and the interconnection between banking, uh, then should should they be? Well, I think that's a question for the German parliament. I mean, they should follow our parliament's lead and have a senior management regime themselves. Actually, this is a point that we frequently make mm -hmm. to our colleagues. Um, uh, we haven't yet made much headway on it in Europe, but we have made headway elsewhere. So I think that's a... Um, that's a valid line of question. So can I just ask, when, when can we expect some of these risks to be mitigated um, as part of these international discussions so that we don't, we're not in a situation where next time round you could envisage a situation where there are, this happens on a, on a number of fronts where it does become a systemic risk? I know everybody's told us in this committee that's come, including from the Bank of England, that this particular case doesn't pose a systemic risk. But if you had it on multiple fronts, it would. So when can we expect yeah. some action, both at the domestic and international fronts, so that we can tidy this up and non-banks on a multiple scale don't on a multiple level don't pose a systemic risk well you as i said there's two ends of this one end is easier than the other so the banking regulator end uh uh we will within the next month have completed our investigation of this hedge fund blow up uh, yeah. and from that will flow various bits of supervisory action and there may be policy as well if there's policy that takes longer because it has to be agreed in basel um, but we'll obviously be straight onto the supervisory aspect. And uh, judging from the interest from colleagues around the world, it's of course not particularly a London issue, but London is involved. Uh, others will want to do, do the same. Yep. Uh, the, more, the more difficult end, and where I, um, uh, I slightly share your frustration, if I'm honest, is the, um, uh, the oversight of the non-bank institutions themselves, because it is hard work to get the global regulatory community to agree that more action needs to be taken uh, about some of these uh, entities. We have been pushing it from the UK end, um, uh, and we are, I think, making some progress. 
but it's not as fast as one would like. And you know, the Archegos case illustrates it perfectly. You know, this was a yeah. New York fund and you know, some of the hit came into London. Could they, can I just, well, just one final one on this, um, well, two sub points, which is one is could, could this be the next sort of subprime mortgage type equivalent problem in the future if we don't get our act together in, internationally and domestically? And secondly, given that, uh, that you identified and referred, um, referred the Wylands case to the SFO, an NCA, the National Crime Agency, um, back in 2019. Do you think that, um, and given that the Treasury was made aware of some of the concerns and they passed it on to the business department, do you think that notwithstanding the barriers that are, you point out that are legitimate between what the bank does and, and information sharing, do you think that this coronavirus large business interruption loan should, you know, should have been picked up given the information was shared, given that the British Business Bank is accountable to biz. So on the first question, subprime, yep. I, at this point, don't think it is going to play out in that way um, uh, uh, for, for the reason that the, you know, one of the big problems with subprime, of course, was that it was developing at a time that the banking system was massively over leveraged and undercapitalized. Um, and we spent the last decade and you know, members of the committee have been involved in this too, um, you know, sorting that out. And I think we are, we'll make them onto this later in the session. We're in a stronger place, but notwithstanding that point, I think we've absolutely got to get a better grip on that. And in particular, this issue about how the margining works for some of these prime brokerage businesses. I mean, I think it's pretty shocking actually that, um, that sort of a hit can come in. I mean, there's enough capital to absorb it. But um, so that, that will be my response to that time. We'll tell if I'm right or wrong on that. Um, on your on your second question, well, I have no insight really into the, the thinking of the British Business Bank and how they make their accreditation decisions here. Yeah, Bjorn Wood is published because of the Chinese wall that exists between us. Um, uh, I imagine they will be asked that question uh, either by this committee or one of the other committees um, looking into this. I suppose the only one point to make is a point of context, which is, you know, if you look at the bounce back loan scheme, you know, that's 46 and a half billion pounds. I think that was a very, very good thing to do, but everybody knew going into that, that the loss rate might be very large. Um, so we have been operating in a quite extraordinary period where the government's risk appetite, I think quite appropriately, has been quite high in order to bridge the economy through. And it is possible that that has been a conditioning factor in their decision making, but that's purely speculation on my part. Yeah, sure. But if the risk, if the risk appetite, appetite, excuse me, is skewed by a high-profile lobbying by from former prime minister, that then raises some much more uh, uh, problematic issues, as we found with the subject, which is the subject of this inquiry. And uh, it, it would do, I agree, but I have uh, no insight to that. Thank you. Thanks, Richard.